Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the third Sunday after Pentecost. As we enter the Pentecost season, that's again the life of the church or the life of the Christian is the emphasis in our, leading, in our readings. And today the emphasis is upon the cost of discipleship, which actually ties in with our sermon series for today also. This is the second week of our sermon series that's done on the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, seven letters that are written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Last week we looked at Ephesus and the congregation that was there. Today we look at the congregation in Smyrna. All of these cities are in the western part of what we would call modern day Turkey today. So as a result of that, we probably will not be reading the Old Testament lesson today as we're going to be reading the letter a little bit later on uh, that the Lord writes to the church in Smyrna. But we'll pretty much follow the morning praise service this morning, the morning prayer service, the matin service that will begin on page 207. And that service begins with the singing of our opening hymn, hymn number 711. 711, Jesus calls us or the tumult. Please rise. As again, we follow the order of morning prayer, the matin service. You'll find that on page 207 in the front of the hymnal. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O oh God. O oh Lord, come quickly to help me. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Praise and thanks to God. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. 
For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all the gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The congregation may be seated as we continue with the responsive singing of the psalm today. That'll be Psalm 67. Psalm 67 in the front of the hymnal. We've sung this psalm once before, but again, just to familiarize you with it a little bit, our organist, Jane, will play through the refrain and the tonal portions. Then I will sing the refrain so that you could hear that once more. We ask you then also to sing the refrain with me after that first time. I will sing through the first two sets of verses. And then if you would join on the refrain and then singing through the rest of the psalm. Was that as clear as mud? <laughs> I'm sure you'll remember this. the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Please join. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And we now turn our attention to the scripture lessons that are appointed for today. Again, it is the third Sunday after Pentecost. 
The theme in our lessons is that of the cost of discipleship as the Lord calls us to follow him. And the thought perhaps being most of all that the believer gives his all to the Lord as the Lord has given his all to us. Now once again, we'll, over, we'll, we'll uh, not read the Old Testament lesson for today. It's from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 21. This is the uh, anointing by the prophet Elijah of the one who is going to succeed him as prophet in, in Israel, and that would be Elisha. And Elisha drops all in order to follow and be that prophet of the Lord. We'll continue with the reading of the second lesson today. That is the epistle lesson. It's recorded in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 21 to 30. Paul was that great missionary of the Lord who followed the Lord through all kinds of circumstances in life. And in this section, he recounts the different hardships that confronted him as the Lord took him through those hardships that he might proclaim the gospel to others. We read in 2 Corinthians 11. However bold anyone might be, I am speaking in a foolish way, I am going to be bold too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's seed? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I am speaking in a crazy way. I am even more. I've done more hard work, been in prisons more often, been whipped far more, and I've been close to death many times. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have often been on journeys, in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the wilderness, in danger on the sea, in danger among false brothers. I have worked hard and struggled. I spent many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty. I've gone without food many times. I've been cold and lacked nothing. Besides those external matters, there is the daily pressure on me of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who falls into sin without my being distressed? If it is necessary that I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Here ends the epistle lesson. We join together now in a hymn of response. You'll find that as hymn number 867. 867. This hymn kind of reminds you of the different difficulties Paul was talking about. By the way, when he says, I am crazy or I am foolish in doing these things, it sounds funny to you at first, sounds strange. What he was doing was people were um, chastising him for, for not being a, a very good apostle or so. And so... Paul did not like to brag by any means. He was not proud in himself. That's why he's saying, I'm crazy to say these things. But I must say these things so that you realize that God takes his saints through the different afflictions so that the gospel might be preached. So it's a strange way, perhaps, of reading in that epistle lesson today. But he's saying, I'm crazy for even talking about these things. He was humbling himself, actually, before the Lord. Our hymn, Afflicted Saint to Christ Draw Near. You've heard this one also. But in order to kind of reintroduce it to you, notice that there are four stanzas to that. And after the last three stanzas, two, three, and four, there is the singing of the refrain that is on the right side page. In order that you might hear the melody once more, Jane will play all the way through the hymn. Let, allow me, if you would, to sing stanza one so that you hear that. And if you would join me then on stanza two and the singing of the refrains and then follow through all the stanzas after that.
afflicted saint to Christ draw near, your Savior's gracious promise here. His faithful word you can believe, that as your days your strength shall be. Your faith is weak, your foes are strong, and if the conflict should be long, the Lord will make you the tempter flame, that as your days your strength shall be. So sing with joy, afflicted one, the battle's fierce, but the victory's won. God shall supply all that you need. Yes, as your days, your strength shall be. Should persecution rage and flame, still trust in your Redeemer's name. In a fiery trials you shall seem that as your days your strength shall be. So sing with joy, afflicted one, the battle's fierce, but the victory's won. God shall supply all that you need. Yes, as your days, your strength shall be. When I call to bear your weighty cross, or sore affliction, pain or loss, or deep distress, or poverty, still as your days, your strength shall be. So sing with joy, afflicted one, the battle's fierce, but the victory's won. God shall supply all that you need. Yes, as your days, your strength shall be. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson today is recorded in the book of Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. Jesus is drawing closer to Jerusalem towards his crucifixion. He still has several months to go yet. But as he draws close to that, um, suffering a death that lies ahead of him, he is calling people to follow him. And in four different ways here you might say, as calling, him calling us to follow him would include, sometimes people aren't going to accept you. Sometimes it includes that you'll have to give up things or you will not have the riches of the world necessarily. Sometimes it will have to do with relationships and you have to follow Christ first. And those are the last two in particular. You can't look backwards, but you look forward to what he has called you to as his disciple. We read in Luke chapter 9. When the days were approaching for him to be taken up, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him. They went and entered a Samaritan village to make preparations for him. But the people did not welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. 
You don't know what kind of spirit is influencing you. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's souls, but to save them. Then they went to another village. As they went on the way, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another man also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those at home. Jesus told him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The congregation may be seated now for the singing of our next hymn. That will be hymn number 872. 872. Grace be yours and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, we're continuing in this series on the seven letters to the seven churches. I'll be reading out of the book of Revelation, the second chapter. If you wanted to turn to that and the Bibles that are in the pews ahead of you, you'll find that way towards the end of the Bible. It'll be chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And again, this will be the second letter that is written to the church that was in the city called Smyrna. Now, in your bulletin, you'll find an insert that gives you a little bit more information about the times uh, that placed Smyrna, and then also a little bit about the congregation that was there. But as we begin, I'd like you to consider this. 
You know, so radical are the claims of the gospel. So sweeping its demands on those who are to be faithful in following it. And really so uncompromising that it does not allow people to just go anywhere else in life except to be faithful fully to the Lord. Because of those factors, you know, it's not surprising at all that opposition and persecution, death are, are to be expected. Almost 1,900 years ago, an elderly man of 86 years stood before a Roman judge. A disciple of the Apostle John and head of the Christian church in this city called Smyrna in western Turkey today. He lived some 60 years after John wrote the letter that we're going to read in the book of Revelation this morning. His name was Polycarp. His crime, being a Christian. He had been pastor in the city of Smyrna for over 50 years at this time. And the soldiers had never touched him before that. But now the state had determined that it was going to crack down on Christianity as a capital crime, punishable by death. The judge wished to show Polycarp some clemency. So he said, just offer a sacrifice, a little pinch of incense to the emperor. What harm could that do? for just one moment. To that suggestion, this aged Polycarp replied, 80 and six years I have served him, he meant the Lord Jesus, and he never did me any wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king who has saved me? In anger, the judge threatened to quash his spirit with fire. Old Polycarp replied, use it if you will, but be concerned about another fire that is reserved for the ungodly, which will eternally quell your spirit. But why do you delay? Come, do what you will. At that, soldiers grabbed him. They nailed him to a stake. But Polycarp stopped them. He said, leave me as I am. For he who grants me to endure the fire will enable me to remain on the pyre unmoved with the security that you desire through the nails. Now as his flesh was consumed by fire, the chronicler of his martyrdom, which is quite well known actually, said it was not as though burning flesh, but as bread baking or as gold and silver being refined in a furnace. Thus came to pass the partial fulfillment of Jesus' words that you're going to hear in this letter when he said, I know your afflictions. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. You will suffer persecution. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Faithful to the Savior were many early Christians, and they are fine examples of faith for us today. They heard the word, and they willingly gave their lives and everything for it. Likewise, the scriptures encourage us after each and every letter that we're going to read. Hear what the Spirit has to say. Today we hear what he says, or really what Jesus says, and the Spirit gives to John, to the church that was in Smyrna. It was rich in the midst of poverty. It was unafraid in the midst of adversity. And in the end, untouched by the second death, it would receive the crown of life. Now these are Jesus' words given to John through the Spirit in Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, 
These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, like the church in Ephesus that we looked at last week. The church in Smyrna was a fairly old congregation at this time, probably founded by the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys when he was in Ephesus. You can read about that again in Acts. You can find that in chapter 19 of the book of Acts. So perhaps this congregation was some 40 plus years old at the time that John writes this letter to them. It was only about 35 miles away from the church that was in Ephesus. That's about the same distance it is for me when I travel between Zion and Peace in Marshfield. However, unlike its sister congregation in Ephesus, Smyrna was neither large nor was it solid by outward appearance, for things had been really tough in the lives of the Christians who were there. They had suffered many cutbacks for their faith in the Savior. The city was closely aligned with the Roman Empire and the emperor. It had become a center of emperor worship in Asia Minor. The city leaders had courted the emperor, his favor. They wanted to build a temple there to Caesar and to worship him. They won his favor, and eventually a great temple to Caesar was built. Now imagine the tension that would cause within the hearts of Christians against the city leaders there. For there is no other God but one. And the Lord says, worship him and only him. In addition, there was a Jewish synagogue in this city. And the leaders of the Jewish synagogue slandered the Christians. You see, Jerusalem was a sanctioned religion within the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire did not quash the different religions that came from the different countries that they had vindicated. Jewish faith was considered sanctified. It was all right, but Christianity was suspect, especially when Christians talked about Jesus as their heavenly king. To the Romans, that smacked of rebellion against the Caesar. So the Jews in Smyrna stoked the fire of suspicion against the Christian church, just as the Jews had done that about a hundred years earlier when Christ Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate. The church often sustains much insult from those who claim that they confess God, but do not truly confess him. Instead, as Jesus points out, such people are bound to the devil as their source of leadership. As a result of this, some of the Christians had lost their property and their possessions were confiscated. For the Savior refers to their suffering and their poverty. Others were imprisoned, or perhaps like Polycarp, they lost their lives. The Christian congregation was troubled on multiple fronts in Smyrna. Not from within the church, as we saw happening with the church that was in Ephesus last week, but from outside of the church. Think of how discouraged they might have become. It was that temptation to discouragement on their part and on Christians' part everywhere that our Savior said, I know your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy that comes from those who say they are Jews but are not. Rather, they are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear anything that you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you will be tested and suffer. So, suffering afflictions, 
possessions taken completely away from you, blasphemed by Christ haters, thrown into prison, killed for the faith. You think that will ever come to any of us? From what I hear on the news, I know it's happening in the Ukraine. I know it happens in Somalia. I know that it's happening among some of those friends that I have that are in China and in other parts of the world. And I would say, surprisingly, there are rumblings of such things taking place in our own country. Do you ever think it could come to such an extreme for us? Jesus did foretell when he gave the signs of the end times that the, such things would happen. So don't be shocked when you hear of the extreme things that happen against Christians in the world and even here. But what else does the Savior say? Amidst all of those things, you are rich. You are rich in faith. You are filled with an abundance of spiritual blessings through the forgiveness of sins and the salvation in Christ Jesus and the blessings that come eternally as a result of that. Christians aren't concerned about safety and rich things in the present time that are just of this life. They are concerned about acquiring the richness of eternal things. It's a result of God's grace to us in Christ. Paul wrote, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich as God, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Dear people of God, you can't become any richer than you are in your faith. We have a Savior who through his humble death on the cross made us eternally rich through the forgiveness of sins, and in that, he points us ahead to the existence that will be ours in the heavenly mansions that are above. There's no poverty there. There's no slander there against your name. No adversity for your life. Through him, in the midst of poverty now, you are rich. In the midst of adversity, you can stand unafraid. Hear what the Spirit says through the mouth of our Savior. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you a crown of life. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. You know, as Christian people, you are forward-looking people, looking to that which lies beyond this world. Sometimes that appears to make people of this world angry. They accuse us of not caring about things now. And we are told, you need to focus on the moment. You need to find solutions to the world's present problems and make this a better place in which to live. But doesn't history point out that this will never be a better place on earth? As Jesus said, right up to the very end, there will always be wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be earthquakes and famines in various places. You will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations on account of me. They will betray you. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Don't we see that happening today, even, even here, just like it was happening in Smyrna? How should we view that? You know, there's a hymn that says, the world is very evil, the times are waxing late. Be sober and be vigil, the judge is at the gate. The judge who comes in mercy, the judge who comes in might, to terminate the evil and to diadem the right. It's that last phrase, to diadem the right. A diadem is a crown. It's the crown that's worn by a king. There's only one that deserves that crown. That would be Christ. But here, in this lesson, Jesus says he gives to those who are faithful another crown. It is the crown of life. And it's pictured in the crown of laurel leaves that was placed upon the head of the victors who ran in the Olympic Games. 
Christ will crown you as you remain faithful to him and his saving word. He will crown you with eternal life. That is your coveted prize. The second death, meaning hellfire, will never ever touch you. But there is more to Jesus' promise here that does affect not only our lives in the present and the future. It's not just about the future. It's also about the here and now. He said, you are rich. He meant right now you are rich. Do not be afraid. You will be tested and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Basically, don't be afraid. This will only last for 10 days. I suppose it's possible that the 10 days could be taken literally here, although in the book of Revelation, many times numbers have a more figurative sense to them. Whatever the case could be, 10 is a limited time. It's a specific amount of time that is fixed by God beyond which it cannot go. It means that God knows the troubles that his people's face in the present, and he limits the influence that evil has upon them. Evil will come because the prince of this world will see to that and bring it. But God's children remain untouched by it and the second death as they cling to their faith in the Savior. To trust that God limits evil for our good and to believe among the many troubles of the present that Jesus triumphs over Satan for us because he came to destroy the works of the devil, that's what it means to be rich in the midst of poverty, being faithful right up to the moment our bodies die, always looking ahead to receive the crown of life that will never fade or spoil or perish. That's kept in heaven for you. So until that day, hear what the Spirit says through the mouth of the Lord Jesus. Keep looking forward. Don't worry. I know your troubles. They will continue, but they continue for only a little while. I will limit them. Be unafraid in the midst of any adversity, for you are eternally rich in the midst of earthly poverty. Be faithful to me unto death. Your victor's crown awaits. So it was for Polycarp. So it was for the people in Smyrna who followed Christ. And so it will be for faithful Christians today. God grant that in our lives of faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as we turn in the hymnal to page 210. Page 210, and we join in the singing of the Te Deum Laudamus. We praise you, O God. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. <coughs> All creation worships you, Father everlasting. To you all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, I sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly host, and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship, the white robed army of martyrs, pray against you. Throughout the world, the holy church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your glorious, true, and only Son. The Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. King of glory, 
the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all the believers. <coughs> you sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, but with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. You may be seated as we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him. Take your hymnals and turn to page 213, 213 in the front. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord, be merciful and answer me, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In our prayers today, we'll include a prayer with the holiday coming up for those who are traveling. Some of our own members are traveling at this time. Also, um, the Baloos have been suffering from COVID virus over the last several weeks. They're at the end of that. They assured me that uh, they're pretty much done with it. But we'll include them as well as all others who are suffering illnesses in our prayers this morning. We pray. O oh God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you and remain faithful to you. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises which exceed all that we could ever desire here on earth. Through you, our Lord and Savior, we pray. And dear Lord, we ask at this time also that you would be with those who are traveling. Send your holy angels to accompany them. Provide peace to anxious hearts. Hold your protecting hand over those traveling by highway or byway, across the sea or through the air. And according to your mercy and will, enable them to safely reach their destination and bring them home safely once again. Bless all our travels until at last you bring us to our heavenly home. And dear Lord, we ask your mercy on behalf of those who are struggling with any type of illness. We especially think of the blues who are now ending their struggle with the COVID virus. Strengthen them in body and in spirit. We also pray on behalf of Lois, who will be undergoing eye surgery this coming week. 
May any anxieties that she have be taken away, knowing that she always rests in your hands. And we pray that you would guide the hands of the physicians, the nurses, and those who will be taking care of her, so that she will heal very quickly. And, O oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of faith, of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we join together in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn. We join in the singing of hymn 695, Take My Life and Let It Be.